All right, guys, welcome to Mid Wales. I'm back on home soil. There's a crispy, clear, cold night ahead of us, and I've just picked up the Skywatcher Star Adventurer Pro Pack. So I'm hoping to get some tracking done. I'm going to start with the Cygnus region. I'm going to hone in on the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula because it's pretty much directly overhead now, so it's its best observing conditions. And then after that. I'm going to hone in on Andromeda, the spiral galaxy M31 and that's going to get higher in the sky later on in the night. But I'm going to have a play with the Star Adventurer and yeah, let you guys know my first impressions. To set up your portable equatorial mount, you want to make sure that your tripod is perfectly level and that your tracker is roughly pointing north. Then you're going to begin the oh so fun process of polar alignment, something a lot of people struggle with at first. The idea is that you are making the axis of rotation of the device parallel to the axis of rotation of Earth so you can counteract that movement. To do this, you need to point the axis at the North Celestial Pole, which is very close to the North Star Polaris. To find Polaris, you can first find the Big Dipper or Plow asterism within the constellation Ursa Major, and then you follow the two stars Merak and Dupe, which roughly point towards it. Now, the height of Polaris above the horizon is always equal to your current latitude, which for me at the time was 52 degrees north, so you can set that on your equatorial wedge mount. Next, you need to pan left and right until you find Polaris in the polar scope, but as Polaris is not directly on the North Celestial Pole, you can use an app to find out exactly where you need to place Polaris in the crosshair of your polar scope. Once you've done that, you can now mount your camera or telescope. For me, I was using the A7S Mark II, which I've had Astro modified for extra sensitivity in the Hydrogen Alpha Emission Nebulae. If you have no idea what that means, you should probably go and watch my video on Astro Modded Cameras linked above. I'm also using the Samyang 135mm f2 lens, which performs incredibly well for astrophotography, especially at f2.8. And it comes at a great price too. I'll put links to all the gear in this video below. I'm also going to be using the Case Neutral Night Light Pollution Filter, which I find really helps with hydrogen alpha targets, even in areas you don't feel like there's much light pollution. Anyway, now you're set up and ready to go. It's time to turn that sucker on and get tracking. Okay, so I've got my composition framed with the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula. Now I'm going to try a three minute bulb exposure at ISO 800 f2.8 and we'll see how that comes out and if I'm happy with it I'll just leave it going for an hour or two I guess hoo, hoo, hoo. definitely happy with that there's a little bit of really thin cloud almost moisture basically starting to blow up from the west and I think it's very thinly just gone in front of the Cygnus region as I started photographing it. But it has caused a really nice Akira Fuji effect where a thin bit of mist basically causes the brighter stars to glow and bloat and you can see their colour a little bit better. So not the end of the world but I'm hoping that that cloud doesn't get thicker and doesn't start covering the North American Nebula even more because that would suck. So whilst I'm waiting for that I thought I'd show you guys the difference with the light pollution filter and not. So on the top you've got the unfiltered image and on the bottom we've got the filtered image. As you can see the filter completely throws off the white balance so here it is with an equalized white balance so that they both have the same colors and the filter also reduces the amount of light that comes through by about half a stop. So here with the unfiltered image reduced by half a stop and now you can see that the filtered image the reds and pinks of the hydrogen alpha just pop that little bit more they stand out better against the background of sky because you filtered out that yellow sky glow even if you think you're in an area completely free of light pollution I find that it really does help with the hydrogen alpha emission nebula
So I'm currently tracking the North American Nebula. So whilst I'm waiting for those, I thought I would go over my history with Star Trekkers with you guys. And the first Star Trekker I got was the Star Adventurer Mini, which I hated because it has no physical buttons and you have to connect your smartphone to the device in order to control it and set up the tracking and I just found that really frustrating so I ended up selling that and getting the iOptron Sky Tracker Pro which is a wicked little portable star tracker and I wanted something that was capable but portable so that I could carry it up mountains and the iOptron Sky Tracker Pro, I still have it. It's amazing. There are a number of different tracking modes, and because you've got physical buttons, the setup is very quick. And one of the advantages of the iOptron over the Skywatcher is that you can polar align whilst the camera is on top of the device. The polar scope is on the side rather than through the middle. Uh, and that way you can polar align with the camera on top but I haven't used it for months because of the the move shoot move tracker it's just pretty much been in my bag the entire time it's so much smaller more lightweight and it's perfect for landscape astrophotography so it's not great for um, like a 70 to 200 I sort of use it with my 135 mil at the push but now I've picked up the Skywatcher Star Adventurer Pro Pack uh, because I wanted something with a bit of a heavier payload and that was a bit more capable in tracking because I really want to try the Sony 100 to 400 and see what that's capable of when it comes to astrophotography and of course for that you need a star tracker an equatorial mount and I'm hoping I can do some good stuff with the the Skywatcher Star Adventurer Pro but the Star Adventurer has a, a really high payload and you can use um, pretty small telescopes with it as well um, so there's opportunity to upgrade if the Sony 100-400 is not that good. I don't know, I'll let you guys know my first impressions. Fingers crossed we get some good results and the weather stays clear tonight. And yeah, I think I'm going to make myself a nice cup of coffee, get warm and do some book writing. Now unfortunately I'd forgotten to bring my lens warmers with me and as you'll see from this time lapse the lens missed it up pretty quickly and the exact same thing happened with my tracking of the Cygnus region so unfortunately I was stuck with this single exposure which turned out pretty good for a single exposure so it wasn't the end of the world but it would have been nice to have done some stacking to bring out some more detail but either way I was pretty happy with this single exposure. Alright, so this time around I'm not using the ball head, but I'm using the L bracket with the counterweight that's going to give better balance and better tracking with a heavier setup like this, the 100 to 400. Now unfortunately I've forgotten my uh, lens hood that would have protected the glass from the dew and the mist, but I think I've left it in the house, so that's quite unfortunate, but I've got this nicely balanced now, you can see the lens and the counterweight nicely balanced now I'm gonna polar align and then I'm gonna aim at Andromeda and because I haven't got the ball head I can only move the camera in declination and right ascension so that's gonna be a little bit tricky but hopefully we can get Andromeda in the frame and do some tracking at 400 so I'm just gonna polar align Now in order to locate Andromeda in the night sky, I always use three stars from Cassiopeia to point out Mirac in the constellation Andromeda. And then I hop over two stars and Andromeda is just after the second star. And I can see it with my naked eye. So it's a testament to how dark the skies are here in mid Wales. That's incredible so beautiful here yeah. I mean even the Milky Way the Cassiopeia region the Cygnus region absolutely stunning right now not the brightest part of the Milky Way but still absolutely incredible in order to frame Andromeda in my composition I started with an ISO of 12,800 and took 20 second exposures to preview where Andromeda was 
Without the ball head, you could only move in right ascension and declination to get Andromeda in the center of the frame. Then once I was happy where it was in the frame, and because I was happy with the overall exposure, every time I halved the ISO, I doubled the shutter speed until I ended up at ISO 1600 and 160 seconds. And that led me to this single exposure. Which isn't the best shot of Andromeda, but it's not bad for a single exposure. It's nice to see that the Sony 100-400 is pretty damn good when it comes to astrophotography, even if it's not the fastest of lenses. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the frames had a little bit of star trailing, but every now and then there was a sharp frame. So I think next time I shoot at 400mm, I'll use a shutter speed of 120 seconds. And unfortunately, I couldn't do any stacking this time because the lens missed it up pretty damn quickly. So, lesson of the day don't forget your lens warmers i'm going to continue vlogging my experiences with the skywatcher star adventurer so make sure to hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on that and the rest of my astro vlogs and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon i wish you good luck and clear skies